Hey there, this is Nick G, producer and host of the Dependent Independent Podcast, and you're listening to Chasing Dreams with Amy J. Welcome to Chasing Dreams Podcast with Amy J. Amy believes that realizing a life without regrets is achieved by taking chances, chasing your dreams, making moves, and overcoming your doubts. The Chasing Dreams podcast will help you overcome life's obstacles, believe in your potential, and inspire you to face your fears. And now here's the woman who is passionately pursuing her dreams, Amy J. Hey, Dream Chasers. This is Amy J. And thank you so much for tuning in to episode 167 of Chasing Dreams. Guys, I want you to meet my friend Nick. Nick has been a podcaster and producer for nearly four years while having a successful HR leadership career and running a family household with his wife, Megan, host of the UBU with Megan Live podcast. Despite having graduated with a BA in fine arts, design, radio, and video, Nick has long since turned off the passionate part of his life to focus on the now. A close friend of his started his own business but needed someone with multimedia expertise. In comes Nick, who for a small window every other week started drawing on those dormant skills and escaped a bit from the day-to-day grind of his career to do something new and refreshing for a friend. As he started building his friend's brand, that creative itch started surfacing again. That passion for creating, sharing, connecting was alive again. So setting a goal of doing 200 full episodes and a few minisodes in between, Nick has set a mission to honestly connect with people around him discussing timely topics that he can relate to and start a conversational experience that he can learn and grow from. Nick says, It's the intimate connections that we yearn for, and although we want to consider ourselves independent grown-ups, we can't do great things without depending on those we care about around us. And guys, we have such a fun conversation that, you know what, just check it out. Hey, Nick, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Amy. It's good to be here. You know, we've been circling friends for a few MapCons now, right? I I think this past MapCon was the first time we've actually had a chance to kind of talk and get to know each other. Yeah. That was me, though. I think I was the problem. You know, when I first saw you, remember... Was I intimidating? No. The whole thing was intimidating. I I talked about it on my show about uh, how conferences... This conference changed me. You know, going to the Mid-Atlantic Podcast Conference the first time I was... Being a podcaster starting in January of 2015, I was still a newbie. I didn't know what I was doing right. You know, and for a new podcaster, you start off, people start listening to your show, and then about nine or ten months in, people stop listening to your show, and then you start saying to yourself, well, I don't know if I want to do this. And because we're so eager to get instant gratification that I went to this podcast conference. I can't remember even how it happened. You know, I connected someone with someone on Facebook that, that knew of this, and then we had a little group and a meetup. I knew that the year before they did it in a gym, and this one was in a hotel. Ooh. But when I showed up there, I only went there with the expectation, Amy, that people did podcasts to talk about what I listened to, like video games and entertainment and movies and jokes and comedians. And, and I was this person just expressing himself, telling stories with to make friends, to make friends, not just with my friends, but to build relationships with people. And I was, you're sitting there, and there's a panel up there, and all these people like Dave Jackson are up there, and... And I think someone connected to the John Lee Dumas, you know, Entrepreneur on Fire was up there. And these people saying they make six figures doing this. And that blew me away. You know, I was like, oh, my God, I think probably the second day I checked out. But if I saw you there, I think, Amy, you were one of those people that I was intimidated by simply because I felt so insecure that, you know, do I really belong here? And and then the second year, which was in 17, that's when I did my eight minute speech. And that was fun. That was fun to do. And I saw you. I think those first two, I think I created a neuroses in my head that said that that world, either I wasn't worthy to be part of that or uh, everyone was untouchable. You know, everyone knows everybody and I don't. And how do I get to do that? And I think this was the year that I came out of my shell. You did? And my confidence, I built my confidence, even though I had it deep down. I'm not going to lie. It's not like I was this. If you listen to my show, it, I, I'm not this. I, I suddenly wasn't this introverted person. It's just I felt I didn't quite feel I belonged until I belonged. And then I found out in this last 
podcast conference. And the irony is, though, between the second one and the third one, I did, did build a lot of relationships, Amy, with a lot of people. So I went in there already knowing people. I guess that was the idea. And not really just talking to people on social media, like really getting to know people, you know, people that I saw at that conference in September that I don't, I, I listen to their show, but now I don't because I'm their friend. I listen to them. I talk to them. I share things. They share things. And it completely changed the dynamic. So when I saw you, I, I made an effort. I wanted to, to, and you were a heavy hitter, man. You were setting up with <laughs> Joe and, and you were emceeing and you had your stuff together. It was awesome. And I just made it a point to walk up and, and say hi. And I don't even know if we really talked prior to me that long. Did we have a long conversation there? We had many conversations because, as you we said, did, right? I was I was running around. But when we could, and I think it was in the beginning, um, we had talked initially. And we had just, you had just finished your speech. Mm -hmm. I believe it was after that. And we had had a conversation. But at the same time, I was trying to watch the time. Uh, but I, I knew, based on your podcast and what you were doing and just your interactions, I was like, this is a guy who knows how to be kind. And oh. I, I say that because, you know, I, there was a distinct difference, right? Because I remember you, again, in passing from the previous ones, but here you seem more open. You seemed, um, you were making friends, you were talking to people. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, what they say about character, it's who you are and what people see when, when you think no one's looking. And mm -hmm. exactly. I, you know what I mean? And so I was like, hey, that's a, a nice guy. And then I saw more of your podcast, learned what you were doing. I was like, this is interesting. This is an interesting story as to what you're doing. Because I also think that what you said about how um, you didn't feel like you belonged until you belonged. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's a common thing people feel at mm -hmm. conferences. Isn't that right? Like, is that, that's not wrong, is it? No, I, I think mean, that's, it's, it's normal. But what's cool is, is that you found whether it was time or whether it was, you know, you meeting other people in the genre that you kind of came out of your shell. That was a great I think, analogy. I think conference conferences are forced gatherings of people with similar interests. Yes. And I think before it was a, I, the first time I attended the conference, I, I realized that maybe my interests were very different than everyone else's. We all had a different purpose while we were doing this, and that was what was overwhelming. Well, I, I, I do think that's true, because I think in the conference, you hear, and when you're talking about the six figures, because not everybody who podcasts makes six figures. Do no, not, no, and that's, do not be I, I use that as that. an example. I just use that as an example. But then with some of the things, too, of even celebrities, like yeah. people that were, wow, you want to talk to that guy? And I'm thinking, who the hell's that guy? Like, right, I've never right. heard that guy before. I don't know who that is. And yet you're telling me I'm supposed to talk to them? I mean, Dave Jackson, I spent a lot of time this last conference. Uh, Dave Jackson does a podcast called The School of Podcasting. And one of my favorite ones is the Podcast Rodeo. It's an amazing podcast. If you are a podcast, you should definitely check it out. Crash course on what not to do. And I remember not talking to him on purpose the first conference. The second, I waited till the end to say something to him. And then this one, I was like, screw it. I'm just going to, I spent so much time chatting with him, like really chatting with him, really talking to him, getting to know him, understanding his, his world outside of podcasting. And it was fun. And, and he's an amazing conversationalist. And, and, uh, he really, um, uh, he's got striking blue eyes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing too. And he takes you in when you catch them, you, you know, you're, we're, as podcasters, you're, 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 I, I have a, I'm recording this out of a studio in my basement, which is also a TV studio. So I have a camera in front of me and, and I'll have the habit of staring at the camera. But when people are talking in the microphone, you're not really looking at anything other than the wall or whatever, or your notes. But when I saw Dave and spending that time the night before I did my speech, cause we were out really late. I definitely stayed out too late, but that was, that was great. I mean, I hope, uh, it was as memorable, it's a weird, stupid thing to say, but not memorable for him, but I hope, uh, I hope we built a, a relationship uh, that we had some moments that we yeah. could grow off on the next time I see him. And, and I think you could, you would, because he's such a nice guy. And guys, we're, we're, I'm trying to get him on the show. We've had some scheduling conflicts, but he is such a nice guy. He's a podcast hall of famer. He has been in the business at least 10 years, if not more. And he's just authentic. Like he doesn't try, like he's, he, he's really good because he does not, it, he's not trying. I mean, he's also, yeah. he's got tons of practice, Amy, too. Yeah, he makes it seem easy. And he he's very down to earth about it. So while he is a absolute celebrity in the podcasting world, he is a regular person when you talk one-on-one. -on -one. 
Yeah. Which case, but don't be a, intimidated, but yeah. And he's approachable too. I guess my, my mindset was those first two conferences that if I'm not worthy to be here, then these people, I can't approach these people. I haven't earned the right to approach these people. And, and I think that was just stupid. You know what imposter syndrome is? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, but for those listening who don't, can you talk a little bit about, about it? Imposter syndrome usually is suffered by successful people. Now, I'm not saying that I'm extremely successful, but I do well in a lot of things because I also work my butt off. I focus. I like doing things that I like to do. I don't like doing things I don't like to do, but the things that I like to do, I try to do them the best I can. And it's that voice in the back of your head that tells you that either your success is not warranted, it's luck, you didn't really earn it. And at any time, people will suddenly realize that you're nothing but a sham. And some people call it humility, but it's really something that a lot of famous actors suffer from. And as as they go up in their career, they win Oscars and they think that they're not worthy. Like I shouldn't be up here. There should yep. be you know other people up here. I don't even know if it's just a society in general because people don't like pompous, arrogant people. So suddenly you create a complex that you don't want to sound that way. But to me, at first, I thought it was because I was humble. And then I read about it and heard about it and realized that I'm, I suffer from it. And then suddenly when I realize what the, uh, the syndrome, what the, uh, symptoms are that suddenly I was like, yes, okay. I, I do that this way. Or yes, I do that sometimes. Or yes, I do that. Which is terrible because as an, if you feel you're an imposter, you never stop to celebrate your own successes. And that's something that I was starting to do. What I think sealed the deal. And I don't think I ever really said this, Amy, to anybody. Mm-hmm. Not like this, but when I did my presentation, it was a presentation. It was something I worked on. It came from a a place. I kept it simple. And while I was up there, I felt like I was, I was absolutely in charge. You know, I, I, I knew that I earned where I was. It was like a culmination of everything I've ever done, not just podcasting, but up to that point to know that, that this had never, this never would have happened if I didn't work to learn how to do something, get, get good at it. Uh, expand my network, my personal brand, and get the courage to present. Because, you know, this is not like my job. It wasn't something that I was paid to do for work. It was just something that I volunteered to do. Yeah. You know, there's nothing, I didn't get paid for it or anything. It was just, you know what, I'm going to do this and hopefully I can, I can move people. And, and the responses were great. It was, I use this as, as, uh, as, uh, uh, to boost my self-esteem is, you know, I'm sitting there at the conference and I'm talking to two people and nothing humbles you more that when there's two people in me behind them waiting for them to stop talking to you so they can come up and talk to you. Yeah. And, and that was, I'm sitting there and I, I'm uh, pseudo gloating, but going, you know what? Yes, yes, I do this and I'm who I am and I need to appreciate who I am because at the end of the day, no one may appreciate who I am and I need to love myself and take care of myself and believe in myself Rather than trying to wait for others to tell me, you know, sometimes you fish for compliments or you, you know, you walk away, not this year, probably at another time, I might've walked up to somebody and said, Hey, was that any good? Was that any good? And then they, yeah, right. And then they fish, they fish for compliments. And then suddenly when you're doing that, you're hating yourself doing it. You're thinking, why am I doing this? Like, why am I doing this? And then when you hear them say it, you're like, nah, nah, it wasn't that good. Because then that's the imposter syndrome kicking in. Yeah. So so when I finally did this, I realized, wow, like, that's it. And I would love to do that again. And I think I have potential of of now, you know, speaking outside of of my day job and uh, actually doing it and adding value. Because I felt in that 22 minutes, I added value to some people. Some folks, you know, came up to me and said, you know, Nick, I appreciate the the your presentation. And actually I, I tried to use some of the things. I don't know if you noticed during my presentation, I tried to use some of the things you talked about and, and that really hit me like, wow, that's great. And that's, I mean, what couldn't make you feel, uh, more satisfied and fulfilled from trying to do something like that, being yourself and being your genuine, authentic self, sharing what you believe in and what you, you feel is the best way to connect with people. And it works and it totally worked. And, and that, that my, I, I can't say I'm completely cured of imposter syndrome, but I'm getting older, Amy. Well, I, and, I think it pops up. I think, I don't think you ever are cured of it entirely. I think it just shows up in different forms at different times. Okay. Oh, you're right. Okay, great. So temporary cure. I got the, 
imposter syndrome flu shot and <laughs> get away from the season and get it again. I think you're vaccinated for a good period, but some, I think it's inevitable that there will be something where you will begin to doubt yourself. Uh, it's terrible. They're, they're your saboteurs that live in your brain. I mean, I try think, to, yeah, I can't I, be done or can't do something. I think we, we all go through it at different times. It's only when we realize it. I mean, if you look back on, your life and think about how often did I doubt myself? I know for me personally, I've been going through it for a while, just different points, different times mm. in law school it, as a scientist. Uh, you know, I could pinpoint when I was at NASA, it was huge when I was at NASA. What am I doing here with all these other scientists and stuff? I'm just a college freshman intern. Did they act? Did it, was it supposed to be me? Was there a mistake? It's, Oh, and it's so hearing you say that. Oh, it's oh, right. I'm so sorry you think that, Amy. Well, I think we all go through it. But then, but then here, if it makes you feel better, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I see you at this podcast conference, and you're moving and shaking. You're a mover and shaker, man. You're an influencer. Like I look up to you. I saw you there, and I go, "Wow, she's oh, the bee's you. knees, man." I gotta, I gotta <laughs> talk to her. Should I, should I interrupt her? You know, should I maybe wait till the conference is over? And then when you ask me to be on your show, I'm like, "No way. This is this is cool." Uh, that that. Some, remember you you had mentioned before about people looking at me in a way when or how they behave or act when no one's looking. Yes, I mean that's 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 what I'm. A, I'm a very observant person. I think mm -hmm. I said that during my presentation. If I you I did. usually sit in the back so I can watch everyone and see how they react and understand how people process and and what's funny and and all that. And and I, I that's it's great. I think it's 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 a fun exercise. I'm not a. I've learned through the art of podcasting to become a very good listener, which has allowed me to observe and listen a lot more and take a lot more in and assess things a little bit better and not jump to conclusions and all those things. So when I'm in the back of the room at the conference and I'm looking at everybody, I'm watching all these people and you, and to be honest, this is not a, a large conference, but you do know who are the influencers in the room and who are the people trying to figure it out. And there's probably less influencers in the room than there are people trying to figure it out. So you kind of, you know, steer towards those people. You really want to know. And then once I got the courage and realized it was okay for me to talk to these people, which is so weird. It's so weird. But I at least I'm honest about it. And I just started connecting with people like you and then meeting with Joe. Joe joked with me, Joe Pardo, Super Joe Pardo, uh, who organizes the event. He Has he ever been on, on your show before? He has Amy? been. He's been on okay. twice. Episode 25 and cool. 100 something. And I have to get together with him because usually it's, hey, we're going to get together. And then I only see him at the conference. <laughs> but knowing from that second year, knowing that he organized this conference, he was, oh, my God, talk about it. He was a celebrity to me. Oh, and he awesome. joked about it because we went to his house and he lives in a normal house. But yet I thought, oh, my God, it's Joe Pardo's house. And Joe Pardo has Amazon Echo turning on everything in his house. He's just walking around going, Alexa, turn the lights on. He Alexa, does. Turn he's very door. cool, actually. Right. He, he's, Alexa, he's turn on he's, the theater. He's so techy, and then he's got a, his car. It's got souped up with dash cams and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, Jesus, I thought I was in a tech man. This guy's <laughs> this guy's hardcore. And and it was just he's humble and cool. And but he joked because again, I looked at him with a different set of eyes. Maybe because I thought I was an imposter there. You know, I don't deserve to be here. So I guess I have to be enamored by by him when he's just people are just like us. Yeah. People are just like people. Nothing. We all are born one day. We all live a life, hopefully, that's satisfying and, and we're happy. Yes. And then and then we die and that's it. <laughs> really, well, you uh, make a great point because influencers, celebrities, we're all, they're all, we're all just people. At the end of the day, we're, we all do things the same way in our core. Mm -hmm. You know, we all wake up. We all go to sleep, hopefully, somehow, some point. But it, yeah. it happens. But well, I want to ask you something because – Okay. Of the bio and, and, and just our conversations before you got into podcasting, you kind of found a spark again. Mm -hmm. Right. But that isn't something that you could have said probably 10 years ago. No. So do you, do you mean getting into podcasting when I jumped into podcasting? When you when you went back into multimedia, let's say it that way. OK, cool. Right. Okay. So okay. Um, previously you were working, you did the career, you did the family, you had it all mm -hmm. going on. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I still do, I guess. Yeah. But yes, you still have them going on. Uh, but from what you're saying is, you know, how happy you were, how you're enjoying this. What was different 10 year, 10 or so years ago? 
Well, 10 years ago, my, um, I had a job and I had decided to, well, I, I, I'd been in my career for probably about a decade and my wife, I'd been in management jobs, but I, I make a living in an HR, in the HR industry. And I, uh, uh, my past was very, I was raised by a single father, alcoholic. My mother died when I was, so I just turned six. I have a twin sister. I was lived with my grandmother for three years. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, latchkey kid, but left a home alone a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I joke my, the reason why my show is called the dependent independent is because I think we all want to get to a point in our lives where we feel independent. Yes. Uh, but it's an illusion because we can't get where we are without depending on others. And that's, that was one of the reasons why I had some of my early guests on the show, because those are the people that I depended on that helped me. And then now, ironically, people have helped me. It's just, that's how the, how that worked. That really worked. I think that was the, that I know that was the logic behind picking the show. But 10 years ago, I, my wife and I decided to have children and I was doing the whole, you know, get a job, get benefits, get a house, uh, buy a crib and work nine to five and find time on the weekends. And that was it. That was really, uh, prior to me having kids and doing that, I was an artist. I was a, I graduated with an art degree, a fine arts degree, and my minor was in radio and video. So at the time when the kids were, I made movies before the kids were born. I messed around with video cameras and tried to, you know, my wife had this Hewlett Packard for those techies. She had a Hewlett Packard that had six gigs of, of memory in it, six gigs yeah. <laughs> and, and I think it had like 400 megs of Ram and I, I went on eBay and bought like a video capture card and, and software and, and tried to, to edit. I was always compelled just to, to, to do something with video and, and, and audio, not so much audio at the time, but when we were kids, my sister and I used to turn the tape recorder on and we would make radio shows and, mm -hmm. and that was always fun, but I was always touching the media side of it. I was just, and it came easy for me. My father was was somewhat distant, well, really distant, but he always had a lot of tech around him. He had the hi-fi stereo system. That, I remember when the dual tech uh, tape decks came out, he had that and the CD player that was like $600. And, but he would give me his old radios and I would just learn how to, you know, when they, especially when they broke, how, to, how they work, take them apart. I always like taking things apart and figuring them out. And when I had kids and when I got married, I just kind of squashed that. I, I, I thought that the choice was when you have children, you're supposed to put off everything. Like that's the idea of being, again, uh, I talk about on my show about making these stupid rules in your head that, okay, great. Well, my kids are, when I'm done being a parent, that's when I'll go back to doing those things. So I just stopped. I, yeah. I was, it was just, I don't understand why I, I did that. And I was, it made me happy. All the art made me happy. I fell in love with my wife in college when she would come to my art exhibits and, and I'd be in the studio my seven to 10 and she was pledging her sorority and they had study hall and in the library from seven to 10 and I'd scoot out there on my breaks and I'd say hi and I flirt and all that crap. So, um, uh, the, the idea of just being a parent, suddenly I put all that on hold. Now, again, I'm not saying that it wasn't fun. Being a parent wasn't fun, but one of the things I used to say to myself is why do kids make you forget who you are? Well, okay. So here's the thing. And here's why I wanted to talk about this. Cause it's interesting when you said that, um, and the way you just said it is, Rules you made up inside your head, but I don't think that it was rules necessarily made up inside. No, your head. I know what you. I know what but you're you know about what I mean? to say. Like, I feel, we're, I feel we're, like we're society conditioned, does right? It. Yes. we're conditioned. We're conditioned to be that. I think uh, my in-laws. When I moved in, my in-laws 18 years ago, this past month, or this past not month, month, this past weekend, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I I worked for a graduated college. I worked for a door to door sales company. I've talked about it on my show. Most of the things I'm talking about, if you tune in, you hear the, all the backstory. Too. Uh, the, uh, the idea of, I'm, I didn't have anything. I really didn't own anything. And then I was in my car and I moved in with my in-laws at the time. And they're telling me, you know, get a job. And, and, and which is good, by the way, I'm not saying that I just moved in with my in-laws and they were like, get a job every day. <laughs> you know, I had to earn my keep. I, I started working at a movie theater at the time and then got a job in Atlantic city, my first HR job in the city. Uh, because my father worked, my father-in-law worked out in Atlantic City. And, but the whole idea was they were all, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and my wife are all public employees. Mm -hmm. They all either teachers, my father-in-law was a, a plumbing inspector for Atlantic City. So you get pensions and things like that. And, and uh, it was never for me. I think I even at one point thought that it would be cool when I didn't really quite know what I wanted to do. I went and took a test called this, it's called a Praxis test, Amy. And you, you oh, take you did it. one. Right. I did it and I, I was 
certified to okay to, you know, I don't certified, okay, permitted to teach from K to 12 art. And then you'd have to, you can get a substitute job and then go to school and learn how to be an artist and, or be a, a school teacher. And I observed because my wife was a teacher for a few years, I was able to go to her school and observe the art teacher. And mind you, the art teacher, uh, I don't think she's even alive anymore. I think, uh, she was like way retired, like, like, right, like old, very old. And she uh, went through the curriculum and the class and everything. And I saw how she managed the class. And I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking, Jesus Christ, is this every day? Like, can I, can I pick what I want to teach the kids? And my wife says, well, there's a curriculum and everything. And that's when I said, you know what? I don't want to do that. So corporate America is my thing. Like, that's what I want to do. You know, nine to five, things change and all this stuff. Right. And, and because that's what I was, t- you know, that's, again, the way you're supposed to be. Because if you have a job like that, you can uh, support your family and, you know, do whatever, get a paycheck every other week. Right. Yeah, it's safe. It's safe. It's, it's safe. safe. It, there's no risks. I mean, at least I could say when before I, I had kids, I made a lot of decisions, not always the greatest decisions, but nothing detrimental. But man, it took me in so many different places, traveling and, and doing all these things. And, and But the one thing I can say that back then I was really myself. I, 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 knew, I knew who I was. Uh, I had, I had moved out of my father's house. My father, not, he wasn't a, a very positive influence. He, I mean, a lot of it is external of, uh, I think a therapist told me once that you know, my father's job every day was to make me feel smaller than him. And once I escaped that and got away from it, I started, especially when I went to college, Amy, I started doing things for myself and, oh, it was so fulfilling. You know, I played lacrosse. I was a president of my fraternity. I volunteered. I, I was good at a lot of things. I played volleyball. I was good in school. I was good. I was a good artist. It was just amazing. And, and I don't know if we just search for that, but then life and everything we're conditioned to do tells us, no, 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 don't do that. Don't, especially when you're an artist, you graduate with an art degree. I mean, back then it was different. I remember they made the announcement at my graduation that, that, oh, next year we're going to have graphic design as an actual major. And I'm like, damn, because (laughs) I graduated. Yeah. Back then, back then I, I, we were on Apple twos and we were learning Photoshop two mm. and, and they used to tell us, whatever you do, make sure you save your file on your floppy because the computers will crash. And I got really good at drawing one, one specific picture because every time you'd get to a point, your computer would crash. Now I got, you know, a bootleg version on my MacBook right here of, of Photoshop illustrator, everything. I just got a vector drawing app on my iPad, you know, that, and, when you Demi, I got a class for it. So it's, it's times are way different, way, way different. But times when I was in college and living at home and my sister moved out, turning her room into a studio and I get all this particle board. I did a lot of sculpting. I just, oh, it was so, it was just wake up the first thing in the morning and just make something and put everything into it and be proud of it is, is, is something that, and again, I'm very proud of being a father and the successes and everything that has happened with my kids. But like to your original question, going back 10 years, that's pretty much where I was 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I'd say that that's where I was. But everything and, was set. And I think that's normal. I think a lot of people listening to this episode have been there, done that, because I think we're conditioned, uh, myself included, because that's what you see in ads. That's what you see on TV. Right. You don't see a lot. Of, now you do. But about 10, 5, 10 years ago, you didn't often you saw someone with a steady income job. The freelancer wasn't really a thing displayed. And when you see it all the time, when people talk about it around you all the time, you feel like you kind of have to have and be that person, right? Yes. But you broke out of that. Well, broke out of it in the sense that... In the sense that you you embraced it. In my head, where fast forward four, six, five, six years into the future, Mm -hmm. from 10 years ago, where... I was so comfortable, not comfortable, but I decided that, well, I'll make friends. Well, actually, you know, I, I was, uh, I would say, you know what? It's so hard to make friends now because one, I don't make, I, I'm not someone who builds really long lasting relationships at work. I just, that's just not something I do. Uh, shame on me, whatever. But for someone who's pseudo extroverted, I really have a tight group of people. I like intimate relationships, Amy. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I like building relationships with people. It's so hard for the, maybe that's just because I wasn't in the popular crowd as a kid in high school where everyone had a, you know, acquaintances and, you know, they, you were measured by ironically like Facebook, like how many people you follow and, and Twitter and all that stuff. But I'd rather have 10 people that I talk to all the time than 
10,000 people that I don't really, that never respond to anything I send out. And I, I remember it was one night I was up in my bedroom and my wife, she was in bed. She looked at me, I was taking off my shoes and she says, why don't you call so-and-so up anymore? And I said, well, I don't know. He's just busy. She goes, what kind of friend are you? Oh, really? <laughs> and, and, and I, I mean, I was talking, she was talking about my, my best friend, a guy that, you know, if he called me now, it's drop of a hat. I don't know if guys are just different than girls in, in groups of friends. Like my, I have my relationship with my friends are very different than my wife has relationships with her friends. Although her friends are great. I love hanging out with her friends. That's weird. That's so great. They, oh my God, her high school reunions are way better than any reunion I ever had. So, uh, it was my best friend and I don't need to talk to him every day. But when she said that to me, it kind of resonated and and I'm thinking like, man, I hate myself. <laughs> like, why, why would I, why would I not, uh, why would I not make an effort, like an actual conscious effort to continue to build a relationship with somebody? Am I taking it for granted because I don't call him every day? I don't say hi every day, but I love the guy. I do anything for him. I've been there when he's had problems, uh, uh, with work and, and anything else. He's, he's needed my support. He's been there for me. But I guess I'm not a really good friend. And as I uh, kind of fast forward through the, the in 2008, 2009, 10, during the recession, uh, I worked at a company working for an HR department at an organization going through a lot of downturn. You're one of the busiest departments because you're the ones who know how to let people go. So I spent a lot of time in between 2007 and two, 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 yeah, 2007 and 2011 of just firing people. And I made it a, a commitment the next to the, the offices I, w- I was in. There was a friend of mine. He's actually one of the first people I started my podcast with. He, my buddy Dewey, Dewey Montero. Mm-hmm. Dewey uh, worked in the office next to mine. He was a director in loss prevention. And uh, I, I knew that the weird thing is, is I didn't, maybe it kind of goes back to me making friends at work. I didn't want to build any relationships with people at work because eventually I thought I'd have to fire them anyway. So I just, oh, wow. I was I just kind of kept people at a distance. That was tough. That's not that, an easy that's, thing. I was going to say that's mentally tough. And 2008 sucked. 2008 was a terrible year. Yeah. I didn't want to leave my office because I had this stigma that anywhere I went, people, you know, if I had, I had a conversation with someone behind a closed door, everyone thought something was going to happen. And it was awful because that's not me. That's not who I am. Yeah. I, my God. Suddenly now I'm being defined by this event that I had zero control over that now I'm the acting party of taking someone's livelihood away in a second, you know, it's not, it's awful. It's not something that I, I, it's awful. And I would talk about it to try to make myself feel better. And it was terrible and put on a fake smile and all that stuff. But my friend Dewey being in the next office over, I started just talking to him. He was about, he's a year and a half older than me. We had had kids the same age. Mm -hmm. We had similar interests. We were into movies and and art. And uh, I really enjoyed spending time with him. And then eventually we built a relationship that when the recession finally took over my company and my company was absolved and bought out that I, uh, I left, uh, and got another job and he stayed there and then soon enough started his own business, which I then uh, was, it was an interesting conversation. He's, he, he, he had this side hustle in his basement, martial arts studio. He built like soup to nuts. It was amazing. He ran it on the weekends and then decided, you know what, I'm just going to ditch corporate and do this full time. And he's extremely talented and amazing. Now he does sports conditioning. His business changed. It's called Zen Sport. If you check him out, zensportspeed.com. It's awesome. If you are in the South Jersey area and you're looking to get your kids faster, that's what he does. He works with kids to help them with mobility to make them faster and stronger. So cool. Such a cool thing that wasn't around when we were kids. And he needed a videographer uh, because he had an accountant. He had a he wanted to do training videos. And I and that was kind of that was kind of a pivotal point, Amy. Mm-hmm. All that stuff I put aside, all that skill set I put aside. I mean, I made home movies for the kids and I put them on the computer and everything, but nothing like, like I, you know, editing on two VHS tapes and intersplicing Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back and, and, you know, sound effects. That was just fun. But fun, suddenly when he, he does this, something changed. And I remember I was in my driveway and I said, sure, I'd love to make videos for you. And then, you know, fast forward a year into it, I'm, I'm doing production videos for him and we're doing, training videos on YouTube, setting them up. He's not as tech savvy as I am. So we're creating YouTube channels and I'm learning as I'm going to Amy. I'm, I'm the internet's an amazing thing. Sure. You know, someone yeah. says, can I do this? And because I'm, I'm my best student, I feel like I can find anything out there and make it make sense to me, make it easy and then just spit it out. So 
because of all this output, he thinks I'm this super brainiac and all this tech stuff. And all I'm doing is taking the time to teach myself how to do it and practically touching it with my hands. And, and, and after listening, I'm a very visual person. That's why YouTube is amazing. I just have to watch somebody do something and then I can do it. So, uh, as we're doing this about every other week, I'm getting together with them and it kind of becomes a routine thing, right? It's expected. Uh, I'm driving out to, um, about, he lives about 40 minutes away. I'm driving. I'm blocking out time on, on weekends. My kids end up coming on some of the videos, too, because they are some demonstrations. So my kids put on the Zen Sports Beat shirts, and they run around the studio, and we tape them and do voiceovers. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I got to a point where uh, he knew I was listening to podcasts. He didn't even know what a podcast was. And I, he said, hey, man, you've got all this tech stuff, and you got a good voice, and we always, you have these really cool stories. Why don't you try a podcast? And I'm thinking, Really? And, and I'm kind of chewing on it. And then 2014 comes to a close. And uh, I'd been listening to podcasts on several websites for eight years, video game websites. And there were these guys who decided to kind of leave the website and start their own channel. Mm -hmm. And I was one guy I'd listened to that's pretty amazing. And I got to get him on my show. His name's Matt Paxton. Do you know who Matt Paxton is? Amy? I don't. Matt Paxton is the former host, but also he runs the cleaning crew on the show Hoarders that was on A&E probably about eight, nine years ago. And he not only was someone who ran all the cleaning crew, but he was amazing on camera. He was funny, but he was a guy who, who hit rock bottom at one point. He was a gambler and tried mm -hmm. everything and failed, but he decided to start a podcast as an extension of the show. But what I really enjoyed about his show, and I'll give him all the credit, he had his wife on, his kids on, and he just talked about who he was and how it revolved around. The show was called Five Decisions Away. And the reason why he called it Five Decisions Away is because on one of the episodes, there was a guy whose house was so full of garbage, he lived in a shack in his backyard wow. or a tent. And in the corner of that tent was a bucket. And we probably can assume what was in that bucket. And he, 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 he made a note on the show and said, we're all five decisions away of going in that bucket. And he, that was the name of the podcast. So he brought people on that made decisions in their lives, either good or bad or indifferent, and learned from those decisions. And I just kind of self-reflected on my show or before I started my show and realizing I could – I mean that's great. There's a lot of things that you could talk about that you've done when you were younger and how do you tackle those same situations today and what have you learned and what can you apply to things you haven't done before. And that pretty much is the, the scope of my show. But I bought a book called Podcaster's Guide for Dummies. Learned everything that you and I are pretty fluent in mm -hmm. on all this RSS feeds and stuff that you, you back then when you never podcasted how you could pro probably take for granted uh, or you would have been so confused by it. But now you listen to it and you take it for granted because you know all of it. So read the book, learned everything, failed, you know, screwed up, couldn't get my show on iTunes. The picture wasn't the right resolution. Had to have someone at work help me out. And I bought a $60, but not even like that, a $40 USB mic, plugged it in my computer and recorded my first podcast on a video editing software because I, I think it was on iMovie because I didn't have a, uh, I didn't know anything about Audacity or some of these, you know, free softwares or garage band that comes with your MacBook. And I just started doing it and you do one show and it was fun. You know, you, I, we planned it out. It's, you know, the book talk about rules, right? Uh, Amy, it says, you know, your show should only be 30 minutes long. So I'm like, all right, 30 minutes long. <laughs> but, and, uh -oh. and you should and you should have two to three topics. I'm like, cool, three topics. <laughs> and I remember my first show. Breaking I'm, the rules. <laughs> I'm like, boom, boom, boom. I know, not even that. It's just, I'm sticking so, so strict to those rules. The first episode I actually did didn't even come out. So I looked at my friend and I said, Dewey, do you mind if we record again? And what we, the plan was that anytime I did any video production or creation for him, we would spend the first half hour before mm -hmm. we did anything to do that. It was a bonding experience for my friend and I. He had never done podcasting before. I, if he's listening to this, I'm, he was terrible on a microphone, awful on a microphone. <laughs> and, I had to, and I had some experience, and I've gotten better, but he was awful. He would breathe right into it, and, and when no one was talking to him, he wouldn't step away. And if he coughed or something, and, and, uh, and I've told him this. So... It became a thing. And every other week we would do it because I felt, you know, to get people scheduled for a show, it would take up to two weeks. And then fast forward, it, I, I said, well, I, I have a lot more to say. So let me do some mini sods. So then I started doing it every week. And even though I do a 200 episode podcast, 
uh, and I'm coming up to episode 96 posts this Thursday at 9 a.m., uh, 100 is right around the corner. Uh, I have 100 and some odd, you know, 60 shows out on the interweb. Interwebs, I say that sometimes. And I'm on YouTube too. So some of my shows are actually with videos from the studio here with co hosts here, videos I've done or Facebook lives that I've done that I put on the internet, which is a lot of fun. So just from that one time of my friend saying, Hey, why don't you try some video to then leading to why don't you try a podcast to suddenly now there's a level of such fulfillment in touching things that could, and it's not so much about the technology as some of my greatest memories of my family are on audio cassette. Remember I mentioned how my mother passed when I was younger and I was raised by my grandmother and, and you can understand the death of my mother turned my family upside down and, sure. and we were young and, and my grandmother had to take us from my father because he didn't want, he didn't feel comfortable or felt confident that he could raise us and all that stuff. And for from like six to nine, but prior to then we were a normal, you know, regular family where people sat around the table and, and I actually did this. I, I took this tape that my sister has she got it from my grandmother and then copied it for me. But it's just – it's several moments in 19, at the end of 1975 and into 1976 of of my sister and I being babies in the back, in the back bedroom, crying. And my mother and my grandmother and my father and my – my uh, my mother and my father, my grandfather and my grandmother having dinner in a way that I've never, as I've been a conscious person, have seen. I've I've never had a meal – you know, I didn't know what sitting down at a family meant until I met my in-laws, until I moved in, in 18 years ago with them. Why you guys sit at dinner and you eat? That's crazy. So <laughs> I didn't, you know, that's not what we did. We just ate, you know, our food was out there and my father didn't come home because he was out at the bar. And then my sister and I would just cook for ourselves and learn how to take care of ourselves. And this tape is so significant because it has moments in time and it's, you know, I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't ask anyone about about it. So it's really the only living memory of all of these people. And, and, uh, it, it, it's not when you record your voice or put your image to a camera. Now people take pictures all the time. Uh, but I, at least when you and I grew up, it was, it was, it was, you were leaving something, an imprint, like you were actually leaving something behind. And when you can leave something behind an image or a sound that actually moves people or changes people's ways of thinking or, makes people look at the world differently. What a gift. What a gift. And oh, I, I say I, I savor that moment, Amy, all the time. And I take what I do very seriously and and I I thank God that I can do that. I thank God for the voice that I have, for the energy that I have to be able to do that and find time to do it and find and fall in love with, with media again and art again in a way that I thought I would just postpone when my kids were born. Because that's what you're supposed to do. And, you know, as an, as an aside, a related aside, um, there is an importance in capturing those memories. And StoryCorps, StoryCorps is uh, S-T-O-R-Y-C-O-R-P as in Paul S dot org. Um, they help in capturing them and archiving those memories for you. So, Nick, you might want to look into it. Anybody listening you all may want to look into it and it's about capturing those stories and capturing those moments and keeping them, preserving them for your children, your children's children and so on and so forth. Um, but I think what you're saying is so on point and true as to what has to happen. I've, I've done shows. I mean, I think I did a show. I was digging for an idea and I'm, I, 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 I told my, my son, my son is now uh, 10. He's going to be 11 in February. And my son, um, I, I'm, we're, my wife and I are very transparent with the kids about the birds and the bees. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing. We don't shun off anything we see on television. We ask them if they have any questions. They know what's happening and, and all that stuff. And I think it's great because I grew up where everyone, my father, my grandmother said, I'll tell you when you're older. I didn't learn anything. And then suddenly crash course, boom, I'm 25 <laughs> And they're uploading all, the entire world into my brain. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, <laughs> no, that's funny. I never thought that's a cool – I might tell that story again, but tell it better. So my um, – so what I decided to do is I, I picked this topic last minute for my show about a time when uh, I dated my wife and how we fell in love and we started dating and 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 I got a little, you know, uh, private 
but to a point where I, when my son decides to listen to that show, because they don't pay attention, when my side son listens to that and he's an adult, he's going to laugh because what I was doing is it was the story of telling uh, His my son how to take care of a woman that you fall in love with and how to be kind and considerate and the stuff you're going to go through in your head and all this stuff you're going to have to deal with. So, you know, the show has been now something that it's like a parenting tool, but not. It's this something, you know, you think of <laughs> this legacy. for him? Uh, no, I, he wouldn't get it now. I mean, he's only 10, but really I had some yeah. family actually that listened to the show that reached out like, yeah, it was funny that you did that. And cause they know me and they know my son and my son's going to be able to go back and listen to that. Now, when like your story core website that does that, you know, I look at this too, as a, as a time capsule, you know, my, my, my daughter's been on my show a couple times and she even laughed because in the first year we did it in 15 episode 13, she was on, we were on a road trip coming back from a travel soccer game and and my daughter was in my car my son was in my wife's car and we played episode 13 and she 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 sounded my daughter's voice sounded very different she's kind of hitting that puberty thing where her voice changes and and she was laughing and i can't imagine as a grown up when her brain looks at the world very differently and looks at her parents very differently how she can they're going to listen to my show and get a kick out of it they might like some shows that i think they would hate and they might uh, hate some shows that I think they would like. My son might hate that show. He might think it's the most embarrassing thing I have ever said out loud. But between the time of, of you know, now he's, he understands the birds and the bees, but when he has the opportunity to do that, that's going to be a great gift. And it's, it keeps, it keeps giving like it's, it's these things where just like that tape my grandmother has, it's something that means so much to me now than it did the first time I heard it, you know, and it means so much to me when my, my grandkids hear it, you know, because that show, I actually, I played it over a podcast, Amy, and I did a commentary over it as oh, wow. best I could to understand that. I think it. I think the title is "Hey, don't tape over that," um, because it's 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 awesome. It's a power of of putting recording something. Everything's a legacy. Everything's an imprint. Every every writing, reading or not reading, writing, uh, painting, art. And maybe that's why I I liked art so much. It was a way to put your imprint on the world in a way that maybe if you roll the dice someone's going to see it and go, wow, that's really neat. I, I never would have experienced that without you actually doing that or, or, or even having something that comes out of your head and you can use anything from a computer to a paintbrush to a microphone to a video camera and actually express that. Because that's all we're trying to do, right, Amy? Just express that's stuff. That's all it is. Yeah. That's all it is. It's just a form of expression is what they say. Well, Nick, let me ask you a question before we wrap up. Because, you know, as someone who's now refinding their happiness and something in joy. What would you tell someone who is trying to chase their dream? What action would you tell them to take today? Don't be afraid. I'm full of fear. It's, it's crippling sometimes because life, number one, life is too short. I, I took a trip uh, to Alaska. My in-laws, the amazing people that they are, decided to spend their inheritance on my, my wife and I and our family and my brother and sister-in-law and their family to take this Alaskan cruise up the coast. We did all these amazing excursions and were pampered and on this boat. And there were moments that were caught on that boat that with my son and I and my, and my wife on the, just talking on the balcony of the boat. And, and, uh, I came back a different person, uh, and what a different person in the sense that I realized why all these rules that I created or all these, conditioning ideas that we've had that, that have been imprinted on me, that this is the path I should be on. Why? Like, why, why do I have to, why am I a prisoner to this? Like, am I going to spend the next 40 years, 50 years of my life doing it? And, 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 and then, and, and doing it in a way that I can foresee what it's going to look like when it ends, you know, where, Oh, it's certain if I do this, this is what's going to happen. And I look back on the first 40 years of my life thinking, no, nothing ever happened the way it was supposed to, but I was Okay. I was happy. I was able to share time with my wife. I always say this. I love my wife more than anything because we get through all the tough times. Easy times are easy. It's knowing that once the, the things fall apart, I just look at her and she, she goes, I got, you know, you got this, I got this. Okay, cool. We keep each other in check. Um, I, I think I would tell anyone that dreams are scary. You know, that's why there's nightmares. You know, you suddenly you realize what things can actually happen, but right. You're going to get scared like me and people are going to tell you just don't be scared, but they'll never realize what you're actually dealing with in your own head. It's okay to be scared. 
I think fear is something that keeps us moving forward. It's, uh, but the problem uh, that you don't want to get yourself caught into is where fear dominates your decision making. It keeps you from realizing a dream. Because dreams are not just whimsical things. They could be simple change. They can be, you know, I want to do this or be this or, or I want to see if I could do this and fail or whatever and take this risk. And when you hear success stories of people, it's always, well, I took a risk. And it's not something that just happened. You know, when I volunteered to speak at the, at the podcast conference and talk about something that meant something to me from a, a, an authentic place, it was risky. It was, I could have bombed miserably. These people could have looked at me like, what is, what is going on with this guy? And it was a total risk, I, I, but I committed to do it. I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to speak. I'm going to write a presentation. I'm going to talk for 22 minutes and I'm going to see if I can move some people and educate some people. And I did and it worked. And now I get hungry. You get hungry and you want to do it again. Yeah. So the fear goes away. And the only thing, there's a little bit of hunger that comes in there. You want to challenge yourself. But anyone who's listening, everyone who's listening, that has a dream that wants to do something, understand you will get scared and fear is okay, but you can't let fear win because fear will, if you don't shut it down, you'll start making rules, you'll start setting parameters for your life, and you don't want to have to look back on it and say that whole, that stare, you know, that cliche thing about regret, if only I had done this, if only I had done that. I'd rather be able to go back. Oh, hey, remember when I did that? Oh, my God, I was terrible at that. Remember when I did that? I was actually pretty good at that. Remember when I did this? Remember when I did this? Remember when I did this? I'd rather have a, a story to tell on the, you know, when I turn 85 and I do, you know, a retro, uh, you know, anniversary podcast, talk about everything I've done. And I want to be able to look back. Oh, at least I did. It. At least I bought a microphone, sat in, stuck in my friend's office. The sound was terrible and did it. Like, I can't believe I did that, Amy. I mean, my life is, I'm in a different place now in my life, in myself, just by doing that. I'm recognized. I'm, I'm, I've made an imprint on the world in a different way than I've ever done anything else. And all because I just went, I'm going to do that and I'm going to see what happens. And yeah, it's nervous and scary and that's it. But if I don't embrace it and just keep moving. And the, and the other thing too, Amy, is when you are scared, just keep moving. Just keep moving. We can get caught up in analyzing everything. And I do this in my head. You know, why am I scared? Why can't I get out of this? Why can't I, how can I make myself feel better? And, and the, the, the answer is, well, just keep moving until something happens. So just do something, just do something. And I, I'm, uh, I think that's, uh, that's my answer to that question. I think it was a great answer to that question. And guys, you should definitely take heart to what he said and not be afraid. Nick, I, I'm so grateful you said yes, and thank you for coming on the show. I had so much fun with this conversation. You're welcome. You rock, Amy. Come on, man. I saw you. You you rock. You're a superstar. (laughs) (laughs) And cut, man. That was awesome. That was fun. Thank you for that. That I feel really. I feel really good. Thank you for those uh, those questions. I feel. I feel really good. I really that was, enjoyed it. I that was, it was one of my most favorite podcasts I've ever done. I right think it was there. very open and honest, and I love that. I love it. That was great. When does the show post so I can tell my friends? The 14th of November, I believe. What? Why are you so far ahead? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will shoot you an email as we get closer, especially no, the week of. So don't worry about it's it. It's fine. I know. I, 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 I'm, I, I podcast in such a different way. I, mine's in real time. So it's it, the whole idea of making the time. So it always happens on the week that, that it happens. Uh, but yeah, actually, that's right. Some of the stuff we talk about on my show is topical. So sometimes it, it would, if it's too many weeks go by, my wife does a podcast called uh, the UBU podcast with Megan Liv. Mm-hmm. And she started doing, that was another thing too. I didn't even talk about that. My wife decided to do it. One came home from a, a night with her friend. They were at a mom's night at a winery in town. And she came back and she says, I think I want to do my own podcast. Wow. And, I don't know if you remember? Do you remember Mrs. Doubtfire? Yes, it was great. Yes, when Walt Williams goes to uh, Harvey Wine, uh, Ryan, the guy he's, he played like he's a, a, a gay man, and his brother is his brother, and he walks up and he goes, "Hey, can you make me a woman?" And he goes, oh, so yes. that that scene that that plays in my <laughs> head. <laughs> my wife says that because I thought, "Oh, that's great." Now the thing with my wife Amy is she records it whenever, and she uh, um. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and she'll talk about it online. Never. So there's no marketing. There's no, she's, she isn't the most recluse. She, uh, she's podcast. the opposite of what, what you would want, um, as Terrible. a client. 
She's terrible. No, she, oh, exactly right. So, and then she gives me crap for for not. Uh, but when's, when are you producing my show? I'm like, why? Like, what's the urgency? <laughs> she had one. She had one that uh, was. I think it was a. It was the end of the summer, right? And I didn't post it till the fall. You know, because I, I I just get sidetracked. And she's really good. But with her show, there I have some voice talent I hired for her show. I did all the graphic design for her logo. That was cool, actually. That was fun. And I, some, I, some of the music mixes, I, it, her shows, it's got a segment in it and everything. It's a little different than my show, but that's fun. That's, uh, that's my, so I actually produce a show and some of the women in town that listen, uh, are impressed. I mean, my wife's really good because she's a teacher. She's very good at articulating her thoughts in a very succinct way. And she could keep the show 36 minutes, never exceeds 36 minutes. Boom. That's she's impressive. It's amazing. It's amazing. All right. So Amy, what can I do for you other than just waiting when you send me a, a notice? What can I? What what should I do? I'm gonna blow up social media tonight and be like, "Oh man, it was crazy." <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, yeah. More to come. More to come. I will let you know. Thanks uh, for hanging, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Take it easy. And guys, that was Nick Goblish. He's doing some amazing things and has found his passion again. And I'm just so stoked to see what he does moving forward. So you guys can learn more about Nick. And find all the links we mentioned on the show notes page over at amyj21.com slash episode 167. That's episode 167. Till next time, guys, keep chasing. Thank you so much for listening to Chasing Dreams. Amy would love to connect with you and hear all about your pursuit of chasing your dreams. Connect with her on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram via at Chasing Dreams HQ. Or you can find Amy on Twitter at AmyJ21. That's A-I-M-E-E-J-2-1. Be sure to visit headquarters over at ChasingDreamsHQ.com for more inspiration, motivation, and resources to help with your own dream chase. We hope you'll join Amy next week. And until then, keep chasing. Keep chasing.